Hello, and welcome to Loyola Marymount University. My name is Dennis Draper, and I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. Each year, we are fortunate to bring in a number of prominent business executives and special guest speakers to participate in our CBA lecture series. From high-ranking government officials, to leading journalists, to internationally acclaimed social entrepreneurs, all of our distinguished speakers share one common goal, to educate our students and local community on some of the biggest issues in global business today, all while reinforcing LMU's underlying mission of teaching business with ethics and social responsibility. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. All right, our speaker today is a legend. Okay, many of you might actually not know that because uh, um, maybe you haven't been around long enough. But he's a technology pioneer, entrepreneur, futurist. Let me give you a little bit of a, about his achievement. Okay, just this is just a small sample. He founded Atari and created the video game industry which I know some of you are too much into. <laughs> he built, founded, built Chuck E. Cheese, where many of you spent your childhood. He's a member of the Hall of Fame for the video game industry, also the Consumer Electronics Association. Newsweek called him one of 50 men who changed America. That's a pretty good list. Founder of Catalyst Technologies, probably the first business incubator. One of the companies was uh, eTac. Uh, you ever wonder who digitizes all those maps like for Google Maps and uh, navigation? Uh, he started all that. Uh, Andobot, first personal robotics company robot that gets your beer from the refrigerator, right? Uh, probably the first inventor of uh, online shopping, probably at least 10 years ahead of Amazon, okay? Uh, besides being a visionary, great entrepreneur, pioneer, um, I, by the way, followed your career for the last 30 years. Uh, I stalked him for the last 30 years. I grew up in the Bay Area, so I, 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 when I landed in the U.S. in 1981, I, I heard of him, heard about him, and I followed his career. Uh, let me say that I think he is, besides being a great entrepreneur, a really cool dude. Okay, <laughs> so I think this is what I think of you. Uh, probably the first and one of the original serial entrepreneurs. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, He's the only guy that Steve Jobs worked for and wanted to work for. I know there are a lot of stories of Steve Jobs, what, what happened between you and uh, Steve. Um, I've also known, read about his legendary parties in the, the old days. And he's the guy that Leonardo DiCaprio wants to play in a movie. Okay, is that a good list? All right, that's, I think, what makes him really cool. All right, everybody, will all of you give Nolan Bushnell a warm LMU welcome? Thank you. Good job. Well, I think we should have some fun tonight. Um, Part of being an entrepreneur is by being out of the box. So I try to be out of the box a little bit. So if half of you, by the end of this evening, don't think I'm stark raving mad, I'm not pushing it hard enough. So here we go. My entrepreneurial journey started at age seven. And it happened kind of serendipitously. 
we always had a garden in by, behind our house, and I was having dinner with my mother and father and three sisters, and they said, boy, these strawberries are really good, but we've got so many coming, I hope they don't go to waste. Didn't think anything about it. The next day, I went shopping with my mother and happened to walk by the produce section. They were actually selling strawberries. And I looked at them, and they were selling them for 35 cents for a little basket. Well, remember, this was in the days when my allowance was 25 cents a week. So 35 cents for a basket of strawberries. My little mind goes kapakata, kapakata. And so I went out, I got all the little baskets I could find, filled them with strawberries, and marked them door to door. And I had my first, and so I'd done the market research, I knew what the market was. Now I had the question. I was providing extra service by delivering it door to door. Should I charge a premium? Or, I'm an eight year old kid. <coughs> Maybe I should discount it a little bit because they'll think that somehow my strawberries aren't as good. But they're actually better because they're fresher. I just decided to go with the market. I priced it at 35 cents. By the end of that evening, I'd earned $7. <laughs> I was hooked. <laughs> my mother when she found out what I'd done, it had a cusp moment. She could have said, Nolan, you took all our strawberries and you sold them. I need some of the money. Or she could have said, you took all the strawberries. Why did you do that? That was really ungrateful. Or she could have said, Nolan, what a great idea. And that's what she said. And I really look back on that and say, gee, you know, that's really cool. Okay, so the die was cast. This is Nolan Bushnell, age 11. I got interested in ham radio. And that's because I, got, I had a third grade teacher that had me do the science class on electricity. That meant I got to play with the magic box in the closet. And I wired up the dry cells and the lights and the switches and everything like that. And wow, I thought that was really fun. And I, took, I went home that night, set up a card table in my bedroom, got every piece of wire, an old flashlight, an old battery I could, and I started to tinker. And I never stopped. Then I discovered a guy down the street who was a ham radio operator, and I got my license, W7DUK, when I was 11 years old. And that led me to be interested, and I found out that I could repair TVs. And so I set up my next business. Oh, I also worked with my dad in concrete, putting in curb and gutter summers. And I decided there was no way I was going to do that for a living. <laughs> so. I put up Bushnell Repair. Now, in those days, a house call, because TVs were big and they were expensive, and uh, you know, they basically cost a month's pay for a TV set. And they were running on tubes, and tubes burned out all the time, these little guys. And so I discovered that you could fix most TVs by replacing the right tube, not rocket science. But to get people to allow an 11-year-old to get into the back of their TV set with all these great big you know, voltages running around, now I look at it and I say, my parents were either crazy or I really, or really cool because they said, well, be careful, Nolan, and make sure you discharge everything. And I did. I, I got shocked a few times, but I didn't die. <laughs> and, uh, and I had Bushnell repair. And uh, I was knocking down serious bucks 
at 11, 12, 13 years old, and I did it. Here, I discounted from a regular house call. Regular house call was five, was five bucks. I started out at 50 cents, and then I went up to two and a half, but I really marked up the tubes so that I could end up basically making $10 a profit for every game, for every uh, house call. Take me about an hour. This was in a day when minimum wage was a buck. Actually, I think it was 90 cents. I'm really old. <laughs> um, then we fast forward <coughs> to, uh, to college. And this was the wonderful idea. The, the U, Utah State University calendar. I was born in Utah. And I sold all the ads around the calendar with the calendar of events and things like that. I actually don't have a copy of my calendars. I don't know why, you know. As entrepreneurs, save your stuff. You just, you know, it's nostalgia. It's like a trophy room. But anyway, so you say, well, is that a business? Here's the business. There were 22 ad pages at $150 each. That's $3,300. I had $680 in printing cost. And I gave them away at the beginning of every semester and every, every quarter. I went from one university to four. I was making more. I was making triple what my dad was making. And I felt really good about that. And I bought myself a Mercedes 190 SL. <laughs> and I liked that a lot. And it was, a, it was a thing where I got used to having a lot of money and spending a lot of money. And so to keep myself from really going crazy, I decided to get a job at the local amusement park nights, selling advertising during the day, working at amusement park nights, just to keep myself from spending money. Because, you know, hot summer nights in Utah, you'd be surprised what you could spend money on. <laughs> and you got paid a dollar an hour to work on the Midway. Throwing, you know, getting people to throw balls, knock down milk, milk bottles. So I am a carny. Can't tell, can you? But anyway, and I learned the entertainment business. And I was, and, and what I didn't realize is that they paid a commission. And so, though I was getting a dollar an hour, everything over quota, I got 10% of. I was knocking down four or five bucks an hour in a world of 90 cent minimum wage. That was cool. But then I became assistant manager, then manager. This is just three months in the summer. And I think that was my MBA. I ended up being in charge of hiring and firing 150 kids for the summer, training them, making sure that they showed up on time, had the right merchandise percentage, did the whole thing. And I was working, and then I was going to school at University of Utah, and I ran into this guy. This is Dr. Evans, who was doing very interesting things with computer graphics before computer graphics had been invented. This is a PDP-1, and it was the first time, this was actually a converted radar display. And this is what video graphics looked like in the 60s. A guy named Steve Russell, let me put this, did a game called Space War. One of my fraternity brothers says, you got to come over at midnight to the engineering building, and I'll knock your socks off. And I said, oh, I'd like to have my socks knocked off. <laughs> uh, and we had, they had a copy in the computer lab. Of course, 
they had to jimmy the lock. We, you know, they jammed the lock. And the computers aren't turned off at night. And so we were there totally in the dark with the little flashlights and playing computer space all night. It was not good for my grades, but, uh, but I said to myself, and this is where the correlations come in, serendipity, I was probably the only person in the world that knew the economics of an arcade at an amusement park and had played this game and knew the economics of a computer. And you divide 25 cents for three minutes into a multi-million dollar computer, or even a hundred thousand dollar computer, and the math doesn't work. So I sort of put it aside, graduated, went to work for Ampex. That's another one. And a company was doing computer quiz. This had no computer in it. It was basically a slideshow, trivia. But they were willing, I licensed a game because I figured out the time had come that the cost of chips had dropped so low that I could actually build a coin-operated game. I went through a couple of blind alleys, but I ended up with the technology and came up with, the, with computer space. The model was a topless dancer down the street, <laughs> which, is, which is a whole other story. But, uh, and then, that was a license. Now, a lot of people don't know why Silicon Valley has so many entrepreneurs. And it's because it's confidence building. The guys at Nutting Associates were idiots. And I was working with them, and I thought to myself, if I go off on my own, there is no way I'm going to make the same kind of mistakes that these bozos are making. So everybody has, who's worked in Silicon Valley has worked next to somebody that's gone off, started their company, done really well, and they said, that guy wasn't so smart. And it gives you hope. <laughs> so that begs the question that Steve Jobs worked for me and went off and started Apple. <laughs> I'm sure I was his bad example. Anyway, two innovations here. One is the Pong game, the other is the polka dot shirt. Polka dot shirt did not catch on. <laughs> Magnavox Odyssey was coming along at about that time. Then we did Consumer Pong. Oh, there's a story that's absolutely true. When we tested our first Pong, it was on location for three days, and we got a service call. We thought, oh no, our technology is not reliable. What are we going to do? The problem was that the, compute, the cash box had totally filled up and wouldn't take any more money. That's an easy kind of fix that you can make. <laughs> Did the Atari 2600, sold the company Warner, they screwed it up. Um, now, I don't want this to be an Al Gore story, but I gotta do it anyway. We were going to do a network of games. And it was going to be based around the Atari 800. And we were going to put modems into closets in every area code and link them together with T1 lines. And the IP, the, the, the stack, the address stack, is so close to the IP stack. And I can remember having a conversation in the conference room where we said, are people, we're not going to have the bandwidth to be able to do the games and talk, but will people type to each other? Everybody said, no. <laughs> people aren't going to type. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and anyway, after I left Atari, they killed that project. We had the fastest modems in the world that we designed. All that technology was sold off to US Robotics. And, uh, 
And I'm convinced that had I not sold Atari and had kept and, and deployed our game network, it would have turned into the internet. I would have owned the internet. <laughs> but I didn't and I don't. So anyway, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, Steve worked for me. Uh, he was rough, rude, smelled bad. <laughs> and so I put him on the night shift, but I did it for two reasons. The engineering night shift, of which previously there wasn't one. And uh, <laughs> because I, he was really good, and I ha he was my secret weapon, because if I had a distributor that was giving us a lot of trouble about wanting to have repairmen come out and visit them all the time. I'd send Steve, and they never wanted him back. So that was a good way to sort of keep them happy. Less, less. But also, I knew that Waz was going to hang out with him at night because he was working full time at, at HP. And so I saw, hire two Steves for the price of one. That's a good deal in anybody's days. So anyway, they left, and then they offered me one-third of Apple Computer for $50,000, which I said no to. <laughs> I've regretted that one, too. <laughs> um, not that I have done the calculation, but do you know how much that would be worth right now? <laughs> I would never take, make that calculation. That would, be, that would be crass, crude, impolite, silly. Anyway, um, I wanted to operate my coin-operated games. We were selling the games for about $1,500 to $2,000 to people who operated them. But the coin drop in those machines during their life would be about $30,000 to $40,000. And so it didn't take rocket scientists to say, hey, I'm on the wrong side of this equation. But I didn't want to compete with the people I was selling it to because they were competing on location. So I said, I have to do my own location. So I said, let's do a pizza par parlor because pizza is simple. You can't screw it up very badly, though we manage to on regular occasions. Um, and there's wait time good time for playing games, and, uh, but we need some entertainment, so I thought, let's do, and, and it came from going to Disney's Tiki Room, and I thought, let's match the Tiki Room with pizza, with coin-op games in a big spot, and we'll have Chuck E. Cheese. And that's what we did. Did you know the Chuck E. Cheese started out to be Coyote Pizza. I bought a costume at, the, at an amusement park trade show. And because uh, I knew my engineers could make him talk, I just didn't think they had any artwork. I mean, we had no sculpture capability or anything like that. And so I said, just make this guy talk, and then we'll copy it. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I called, and I said, how's the coyote doing? He says, we don't have a coyote. And I said, we don't. He says, it's a rat. <laughs> and, and, you know, caricatures, you know, kind of you read in your mind. And I thought it was kind of a wily coyote kind of thing, but no, it wasn't. It was a rat. <laughs> so it was going to slow down my time schedule. So I said, okay, Rick Rat's Pizza. Well, I talked to the marketing department, and they said, this is a restaurant. Rats are dirty, you'll get a D and, and you know, it's just, it's the wrong image. I said, well, can we, can it be a rat, but we'll de-emphasize his ratness? <laughs> they said, yeah. I said, okay, you come up with a name. And I said, but it's got to be a happy name. And so they said, came back and they, they were all smiles. They said, we got a three smile name for you. And I said, what's that? They said, Chuck E. Cheese. And that's how it's done. Still think it would have been good to be Coyote Pizza, but anyway. 
in Chuck E. Cheese, you know, I've got so many of these. It could have been me. Uh, this is a PDP uh, seven, or, uh, a deck 780, a VAX 780. This was the hottest science computer around. And I had a project in Chuck E. Cheese to do computer-aided animation. And it was way, way, way too soon. It was taking over, you know, just for regular TV screen. To render in those days it was taking 48 hours. And the computer would crash about every other time. So we were getting about one and a half frames per week with the thing running full out. And so we basically created a bunch of software trying to fix things and that. And we sold it all to George Lucas, who basically built on top of our software in a company that was called Pixar. This could have been mine. <laughs> anyway. Then I did uh, a thing called ETAC, which was, again, used a whole bunch of axes, and we matched dime files and created a dead reckoning system. This company was started in the middle of the Pacific Ocean at four in the morning because there was a sat nav but you could only get a fix once every 24 hours because the sat they, they were in polar orbits and, and you could get it would only do a Doppler shift so you knew where we were and then you'd have to put in dead reckoning over that and we calculated and figured out an algorithm right on the chart table and said we could do this really really well if we had accurate maps and we figured out how to do it. We, this was not based on GPS. GPS was four years in the future. And GPS, in the early days, because they didn't want bomb delivery and things like that, they, it was only good plus or minus a half a kilometer. You know, that's no good for navigation. But our technology allowed that all to happen. And, uh, and if you... If you look at anybody now, it's all based on the ETAC uh, database. We sold it to News Corp because they thought and we thought that the economic model for electronic mapping in a car would be like Yellow Pages. But instead of linked by telephone numbers, it'd be linked by geographical location. So if you hit hamburger hungry if McDonald's had paid X number of runners, the Golden Arch would spring up on the map. Hasn't happened that way, but it could have. And then I did robots. Oh, what a tale of woe. There are certain times, you know. Now, notice the cadaveroscope, that was what my animation project was called. The technology wasn't good enough. Robots in the early 80s were equally horrible. And I spent so much money on this, and I just couldn't get the, the units to be robust enough. And robots are a problem, because think about when a computer crashes, it's a blue screen of death, no harm, no foul. If a robot, the computer crashes, it shuts down all of your collision avoidance, all your safeties, and all of a sudden you have a 50-pound guided missile running across at full blast. We affectionately called that the mow the baby mode, and, which, which is a real problem. But it was called, oh, it was uh, robots. I mean, we, we had great marketing. We sold a lot. We, we sold some as, as a uh, thing, but I lost $28 million in cash on this thing. This could have been mine. Anyway, I did a, uh, a toy company, sold it to Hasbro, but there are 
a whole bunch of products here that did really, that was Waz, he was, we were working together on this thing. But this thing called Breath Blasters was the funniest product that was the biggest failure I've ever had. <laughs> now, market testing, every little boy wanted to have it. I mean, basically it was a, a hollow plastic, ugly ball, and when you squoze it, a bad smell would come out. We had clever little names like Dog Breath, Victor Vomit, um, Morning Mouth, Fiona Fish. I mean, it was, they were bad. And we just sold the hell out of them. Shipped them. They came out of the box, went on the shelf. In six hours, they went back in the box because the packaging leaked. And as you walk down the, pe the aisle in Toys R Us, it smelled like death. <laughs> the kids wanted it. The, the, the market research was off the charts, but there was no way to get that into the marketplace. If, it, if the Internet had been alive then, we'd have really made a killing. But anyway... Then I did U Wink. This was a restaurant chain. I don't know if any of you've been here, but we had um, we had screens at every table. Now talk about really crappy timing. The good multi-touch touchscreens had not been invented yet. This was three years, four years before the iPad. The, our terminals cost. Ten to twelve thousand dollars per table, and an iPad did it for four hundred. And we had so we wrote our own software. We did all this stuff, and then uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed, and we we had to close that puppy down. That was another smoky hole. I don't know if you're getting an idea here, but I I've got about a fifty percent track record here. <laughs> I, this is kind of my life. See, I love this sign. This is an actual real sign that somebody put up. I thought it was funny. Okay, what am I working on now? I'm l working on some immersive physical experiences. Uh, the whole idea is that how do we get people out together? Like I'm working on a uh, musical, an immersive musical. Think of going into a series of rooms and uh, everybody, the whole thing is around you and that's scene one. So instead of having a Fresini march, you, you pipeline the audience through. And uh, I think it'll be open somewhere around August, September of next year. So I'm, I want you to all come many times and buy a lot of tickets. Um, I'm working on Brain Rush. Education right now is a disaster. Now, I know that I'm here at a college, and I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but it turns out that everything we know about the brain is not being used. Like, it's the first day of school, little Johnny comes in and the teacher says, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And little Johnny says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, school really hasn't changed that much, even though our brains are very different. When I started to go to school, School was the most interesting and exciting thing that was happening. The alternative was watching the corn grow in the river flow. You know, that's really boring. <laughs> that's not who we are today. Like, we meet for coffee and we get together for dinner. We have fun at the museum. We have fun at the beach. And 
Of course, we go and visit grandma. <laughs> but our tools and our cell phones and our lawn, online personality changes our brain. We're wired differently today than people who are not online. It's a fact. Do you need to know the same things that you needed to know 20 years ago when you can just Google it? Probably not. But you have to have a lot more visceral understanding and problem solving. Exercise is very important to your brain. You can increase your capability by exercising twice a day. We're training out, we're training out creativity. This doesn't work. Um, but we're actually teaching wrong way and wrong things. I believe that in primary and secondary education, we need to have no grades and no grades. The first no grades is, are you in the third grade, fourth grade, or are you sophomore, are you freshman, junior? That's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is it implies, by its very nature, batch processing. And everybody's a little different. And when we are you know, measuring against each other, there are some winners and there are some losers. The winners are enthusiastic already, but the losers are constantly measured, when in fact they're doing very well. Did you know that our software has determined that there are a lot of cognitively brilliant kids who have just a little bit slower clock speed? euphemistically and politically correct, says, he's a little slow. That's a pejorative. When in fact, shouldn't be. Does it really, really matter in today's world if it takes somebody 1.3 minutes to solve a problem instead of one? It does in our educational system, but it doesn't anywhere else in the world. And so, I think that when we can get rid of grades so that at some point parents decide to kind of throw their kids over the transom, and from that on time, they progress through the curriculum at their own speed. The guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. Then no grades. Now, think about this for a minute. What if all education is about mastery, and that without grading, is there a forcing function? Are the teachers that will be selected the same teachers when there's no grading than when there is grading? I can remember in college saying, oh, that's a case A from that guy. Did I learn more? No. Anyway, here's, my, here's what I believe a junior high school day should be. You should exercise aggressively for 20 minutes. You need to have your heart rate above your 80% level for 20 minutes. That causes your brain to secrete BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is a precursor protein for brain and dendrite growth. That says that some of what you're going to be learning for the next, and the effect is about three hours, for the next three hours, you're going to be putting some of what you've learned into hardware. So get your heart rate up. You only have to do it for 20 minutes. Boom. You'll be better. Then you have breakfast. Then you have intense computer problem solving, do things, project things. Then you have a snack and free time. Your snack should be oily fish chocolate and green tea. Put it all in a blender. <laughs> no, but you want to have certain of the things that are found in each of those things, particularly the oily fish. Uh, then you have problem solving and project-based, and then you have lunch. Spark is an interesting book that talks all about the effects of learning and exercise. It's by 
a good friend of mine, John Ratty, who's a Harvard uh, professor. And it's a fun, it's a fast read. If everybody followed his prescription with no change in curriculum, just change in exercise, outcomes can be increased by one full standard deviation, in some cases two. Anyway, okay, now we're in the afternoon. We have, after lunch, we take a nap. And NASA has done a whole bunch of studies and found that a 20 minute nap after lunch increases efficacy after, for the full, whole afternoon, by as much as 30% more. So you, you have a nap, then you have to exercise again, because remember, the exercise effect, only, the BDNF only lasts for about three hours. So you have two exercise periods, and then you go off and you do things, and, and you have your school to end. These are Google sleeping pod, nap pods. These are Chinese nap pods. <laughs> and I thought these were kind of interesting nap pods, too. Um, but we really should be serious about this. Naps are cool. Games are cool. Chess, Go. This is really a wonderful game. And what are we, and, and this is really important for entrepreneurship. Why? Entrepreneurship is about predicting the future. And when you play chess, you're predicting the future by going through patterns and branches. And a really good chess player can go through, you know, can project out various outcomes based on you know, unexpected responses or expected responses from your opponent, 12, 15 moves. A good entrepreneur knows what is going to happen based on various things and knows how they're going to react in each of those situations. So it's good mental cognition. Of course, then you have work, Minecraft, you need to learn. And then, if you want to learn a lot of good stuff, well-produced, go into, go into YouTube. How many have seen this guy's stuff? It's really awesome, isn't it? Good stuff. I know there are professors in the room, but this doesn't cut it anymore. What about this guy? Some more good stuff. His idea. Instead of this, huh? That's that's physics. That 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 brings it home. Good fun stuff. Anyway, boy, this thing likes to do trouble. What should a high school student learn? Selling on eBay, typing at 50 words a minute, simple coding, Unity and Basic, entrepreneurship, um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Google Analytics, write and produce a YouTube video. I hate high school reading lists. They're so stupid. <laughs> They're preparing you for life in 17th century England. <laughs> now, science fiction, particularly good science fiction that is, I mean, there's a lot of noir stuff and we really don't need to prepare for the end of the world. But the other science fiction Flicks, get your mind ready to embrace new futures, new opportunities. I mean, we've had self-driving cars for a long time. In fact, right now, if you read a science fiction book and they talk about driving somewhere, I just laugh at them. I said, man, did you, you, know, you just lost my permission to believe. Anyway, a year of Wired Magazine. If you really want to know what's going on, and it's broad-based, but it's probably as up-to-date as any thing that you have. It's good. The year of the economist. We are citizens of the world today, and there's nowhere that you can get a better cross-understanding of what's going on in the world. And believe it or not, 
The United States isn't ahead in a lot of things. Our banking system is probably 10 years behind a lot of parts of the world. I have some friends in Scandinavia that have not written a check in 10 years. And so you've got to be aware of that because that can be some opportunities here. And of course, they're key business books. I, I love everything by Clayton Christensen and uh, Malcolm Gladwell and a lot of those guys. But just, just read stuff. And then, of course, there's really a good one. It's called Finding the Next Steve Jobs that I wrote. And, um, and I, I can say not only are the, is it fun to read, it's fun to give to friends, and it's fun to eat, and it's fun to eat for breakfast. So, one of the things you need to learn is today we have to be ever diligent. And I put this up because it encapsulates some of the crazy things that's going on right now, because we can live in a bubble if we want to. And I don't think that's a good thing to do. And uh, it's not necessarily true because you found it on the internet. And you have to get cross-correlation, and it's really hard. The world's looking for the non-credentialed things. None of these guys graduated from college. Many of them were high school dropouts. Um, and which brings me to the idea that you're in entrepreneurship. How many companies have you started? Have you started one when you were 10? Did you have a lemonade stand? How many times in your life have you been paid by your customer and not by an employer? I realized that I'd had about seven startups before I started Atari. Do you think it's reasonable to try out for the NBA if you've never played standlot ball. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, do a lot of things. There's another thing that, that you need to do. Write business plans. Not big tomes, but three or four pages. And answer six questions. Customer acquisition cost, What's your market size? What's your likely customer demographics? What's your likely startup cost? And only start a company that you can start with no money. Zero money. Now, you say, well, start with no money? Yeah, start with no money. There are millions of jobs that you can create with no money. You just got to get your head around it. For example, there's a guy and his wife who live on a mountaintop in Aspen, Colorado, in a house that's worth about 15 million bucks, probably more than that now. And they started with no money. And they had one skill. Well, he could make a catalog on the internet, and she had good taste. And they would go around and find little objects of art and things, and they'd travel around to the county fairs and swap meets and what have you. They'd see coo cool little things. They'd put it in the catalog and take orders for it. And the ones they got enough orders, they would go get it built in China, ship it over by the truckload or the container load, and to a distribution house that they didn't own. They had no employees. They were doing $80 million a year. So, 
If you have an idea for a product, make a sell sheet, get a customer. Once you have the customer, there's a jillion companies, domestic, US, China, what have you, that'll build it for you. No money. It's a matter of doing the deal. Now, where do you get ideas? I'm really grateful that I had a whole bunch of different jobs. I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to do the video game, but I had a lot of different things and experiences. So maybe one of your quarters or one of your semesters in entrepreneurship would be go and live in Las Vegas and go to every trade show that's there. And there's about 20 going on at any particular time. And what that would do is give you an overview of a tremendous number of businesses. Now, right now, you can do arbitrage. That means you see something in one industry that is normal that isn't used over here at all. That's an opportunity. Because a lot of times those ideas can be transitional. And the last thing you want to do, and when entrepreneurs come to me and they say, everybody's going to want this, I say, uh, don't. <laughs> no. Find something that only a few people want. That are, ID, that are easily identified. If you try to go after something for everybody, you don't have the infrastructure to be able to take care of it. And so the minute you prove that there's a demand, you'll get knocked off, and you've just done really good market research for the big guys. If you've got a little company under the radar, you can create a pretty good sustainable business. You get the infrastructure. And pretty soon, you can start innovating in another area. Do not start a company if you only have one idea. You've got to have a lot of ideas. And that's why you need to write little mini business plans. Right now, I am marinating about 30 business ideas. They're on my shelf. I write down what it is. I do a little spreadsheet, generally two to three pages. And I do that, and then I put it on the shelf. I call that marinating. And one of them is going to talk to me. And why does, when, when do they decide to talk to me? They talk to me when I find the right person or the right group that I think, yeah, they could probably do that. And then I try to get them, mash them together with the idea, and we've formed a company. And it's the company that's at the right time. Like what I found is I had this idea to do a personal robot, but the timing was wrong. I had this idea to do this interactive restaurant. The timing was wrong. And that's what happens sometimes when you only have one or two ideas. The ideas are sort of forced on you. So, what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is defined as the person who organizes land, labor, and capital. Well, for, for an enterprise. To illustrate that, Johnny wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to start a company. And so goes to work and says to the smartest marketing person he knows, Mabel, I want you to start to join my company. We'll all be rich. Uh, can we meet at your house on Saturday? She says, well, sure. Let's do that. And then you go to the smartest finance person you know, and you say, John, I'd like you to join my company. We'll all be rich. Can you bring some coffee? Meeting at Margie's house on Saturday. And then you go to the best technical guy you know and say, uh, you know, we've, uh, I want you to be part of my company. Could you bring some donuts and meet at Margie's house on Saturday? And so Saturday comes, and on your way there, 
you think to yourself, I don't know what this company's gonna do, but I'm just gonna tell them we're gonna do left-handed widgets. And so the day comes and you, and they say, well, what's this company gonna do? He says, well, we're gonna make some left-handed widgets. The market's gonna be huge. Now, if you've chosen wisely and well, they will say, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. To which you say, well, what do you think we should do? And if you've chosen wisely and well, the marketing person will say, I just ran into a need like this. And your finance person says, I think I could get that funded. And the marketing, uh, you know, the engineer says, I can build that. And you've got an enterprise. It's your company, so you've got over half the stock. <laughs> you haven't provided the idea. You haven't provided the coffee or the donuts or the location. But it's your company, so you get half the stock. Um, the company, however, would not exist if it hadn't been for your design to organize the land, labor, and capital. Now, I, I tell that story a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Hopefully you're going to have some capability, though it's not necessary. There are a lot of companies that are run by really stupid people, <laughs> quite successfully. Anyway, um, but keep your mind Flexible. I advise people all the time, do not hire the dead. And, you know, dead people have no life, they have no energy, and they're in a box. What you want in your enterprise is you want people that are full of life and are out of the box. And so whenever you're looking at people that are your friends, or your employees, or your associates. Make sure they're alive. Companies that are run by zombies are horrible. And yet they're all over the place. Go get a driver's license sometime. Sorry, that, that was really me. <laughs> Am I running out of time? I'm, I'm out of time. Oh, I've got a whole bunch. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I was going to talk about the problems. Basically, we're going to run out of a whole bunch of jobs, robots. Oh, here's a fun one. Who's, what's this? This is a cowboy. Most of the beef in the next 20 years will be done, it will be grown in vats. No, no bone, no, no uh, you know, hide, no excrement. It's gonna make the vegetarians go crazy. Uh, and uh, all kinds of retail automation stuff. These are all the jobs that are gonna be lost. And then there's a whole bunch Oh, I got that one again. Um, now nah, I don't need to do that one. Oh, one of the fun things. The self-driving car will allow us to garden all our streets. Think of all our streets going away and turning into parks. All traffic should be underground. Think how quiet and wonderful have you ever stopped to think about how ugly all the cars parked along the streets are? How chaotic? Wouldn't it be nicer to just hear the birds chirping? This will all be possible because we're going to be able to do a lot of cool things. Of course, there's the Hyperloop, goes fast. Uh, aquaculture goes wet. Um, anyway. It, I, you know, it, I get too carried away with stories, and I, so anyway, but we've got a really good life ahead of us, and I can hardly wait. And the best way 
to predict the future is to invent it. Thanks. Thank